Hi guys, welcome to our Syria Deeply Google Hangout with Hans Eriksson, the Executive Chairman of Bamboozer, one of the most important digital tools in the Syrian revolution. It's been fascinating to watch Bamboozer grow and watch its broadcast from the ground. Hans, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So Hans, you're in Stockholm, but your users are all over the Middle East, especially in Syria. Can you tell us how Bamboozer works and how you built up a community of contributors in Syria specifically? Oh, that's a long story. Let's try to make it short. Um, I'm not going to go into detail technically how Bamboozer works, but but basically it's it's a software uh, that anyone can use to broadcast live video either from their mobile phones or directly from their uh, from their computer via webcam or a DV cam. So that's the basics. The beauty with Bamboozer and why. Why I think what's what I think is an important um, a part of our, why Bamboozer has grown in the Middle East is that Bamboozer works on on a wide variety of operating systems and handsets. Works from everything from from simple Nokia mobile phones to the latest iOS uh, devices. So pretty so much any we, phone with a camera can go live with Bamboozer. Pretty much, pretty much every everything, but for Blackberries. Uh, oh. But that's not our fault. So let's not get, go into detail about okay. that either. And uh, this is something we watch Bamboozer. I mean, this certainly predates what happened in Syria. We've been seeing people in the Middle East broadcasting live from protests in Egypt, from around the region. And did you notice there there came a moment where this really took off? Absolutely. Uh, I think it was on the twenty sixth of November, two thousand ten when the opposition had organized uh, try to cover the elections in, in Egypt as the Mubarak regime didn't allow any international observers into the country. Uh, and just during that single day, 10,000 unique videos came out from Egypt. And it was their, uh, their way of capturing uh, what was going on at election uh, or poll stations uh, and trying to capture anything that wasn't that that wasn't done in the correct way, uh, and and from there it all started, and then people more and more started using Bamboozer in Egypt, and it quickly spread to to countries uh, around Egypt, uh, and 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 then from there it's it's pretty much grown within the Middle East, I would say. That's interesting. I always thought of Bamboozer as this kind of parallel media in the in the Arab world, but I didn't realize it was also kind of elections monitoring in Egypt, and then came the Arab. Spring first in Tunisia in a month later, I suppose. But uh, and in Syria in particular, it, it seems like Bamboos just played an even more prominent role. Is that just because this has gone on for so long? How did the community in Syria come together and start using Bamboozer as a tool? Uh, that that's that's very much a coincidence, I would say. Um, I think could be like 18 months ago or something like that. We started seeing some videos coming in from Syria, videos of peaceful demonstrations, particularly from uh, from Dara in Syria, and uh, uh, media's focus on Syria was none at the moment. Nobody cared, uh, and I personally started to uh, to talking to these guys uh, to to get to know them and, and understand what they were doing, and they turned out to be the pretty much the foundation of, of the Sham News Network. Uh, and since then we've been talking and, and, and the community has been building in, in, in Syria and, and we've been helping them as we're trying to help any activist in the world uh, which is basically trying to distribute the content and get the world's attention on, on what's going on. And in certain cases trying to help them with, with technology advice, safety issues and so on. So it's 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 been a long, a very very long process, both in in terms of of getting to know those individuals and those groups, but also uh, uh, getting media's attention to what was going on and what kind of of content was coming out from the country. As that Syrian community of Bamboozer users started broadcasting, was there a moment where you realized, wow, this is this is history and it's live on Bamboozer? I mean, when was that turning point for you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a really good answer to that. Uh, uh, we, we, when we, we, the dialogue we had with them was that they wanted to get the world's attention to what was going on in Syria, and the opposition's approach to that 
to, to the Assad forces violence against the, the population in Syria was for, for the people to go out in peaceful demonstrations and, and show that, hey, we're not, we don't want to use violence, we just want a peaceful uh, uprise here, we want a dialogue, and then everything escalated, and, and at some point uh, those peaceful demonstrations, videos from peaceful demonstrations, uh, went into something else where people was, were actually capturing uh, gun battles in the streets, capturing uh, shelling of, of cities if it was Homs, Dara, Dersor, uh, Aleppo or Damascus. Uh, so, so it kind of developed, and there, be, there have been so many moments during these 18 to 24 months that, that have been crucial, I think, very much to me as an individual uh, in, in getting to understand and, and getting to know the people there. So it's, it's kind of hard to point out specific moments in, in, in that relationship. But then you have the other relationship towards media, and there, there are some specific uh, days and and and, and uh, things that that right. certainly so has I'll, meant I'll a lot for to us in Syria. Yeah, Sorry? I'll throw out the moment. I really had a feeling that bamboozer is something very very different. Is I think many many of us were watching the feed from Homes that went live on Al Jazeera, and you had a bamboozer user. It seemed he was just sitting there in the midst of all this shelling, going live on his cell phone and not budging from the scene. What was going on that day and what was it like for you watching it and realizing this guy's in the middle of this fight and live on your internet network essentially? Um, no, it, it, of course it's mixed feelings uh, seeing that. that. That was not the first time he was broadcasting. He'd been broadcasting quite a lot up until the day when the Assad forces bombed the pump, a pipeline in Homs. Uh, and and that's that's the first time media really got to understand what bamboozer was. And that was the first time actually in TV history where user-generated video was used uh, and, and being aired live onto the ba major TV networks in the world. It wasn't only live on Al Jazeera; it was live on BBC, on CNN, on Sky, on Fox. Uh, and, and that was a breakthrough, not only for us, but for the, the Syria broadcasters as well, realizing that we have power, we can, we can show the world what's actually, what actually is going on. And that specific Homs video had, I think, the reach, the total reach of that was more than one billion people, wow. which is amazing. Uh, and we've been seeing plenty of, of, of those videos uh, coming out over the past 18 months that have had a reach similar to that. I was amazed. I remember when I was watching that Holmes video, it reminded me of the first war, the first Gulf War in Iraq, where you'd watch CNN and you could see the real-time bombing of Baghdad, but this time it was the shelling of Holmes and it was a user on the ground, which just seems like mm -hmm. such a sign of the times. But it, and it leaves me also wondering, who are these people? Do you know them? I mean, who are these people broadcasting on Bamboozer? What are they like? Is there an average profile? I mean, how did you get to know them? How did you get to trust them over time? Uh, it's it's not me getting to trust them. It's it's about them getting to trust us. Uh, I would say, and and I think I have on my Skype contact list. I think I have approximately 150 to 200 Syrian broadcasters. I don't know the real name uh, on any one of them. I speak to quite a few on a daily basis uh, via the chat or or or. Uh, 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 via voice, but I, 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 I know them as individuals, I don't know who they are, what their backgrounds are, what their names are, what, what, uh, um, what job they have or had, but I, what, what I, I've learned and what I appreciate a lot is that it's, they are all people with big hearts, they're exceptionally friendly, and what amazes me the most is that all of them, I would say, has a huge sense of humor despite the situation they're in, which is absolutely amazing. You give us a taste of that. What are the I <laughs> a sense of humor in Syria? Uh, no, right like, like, I, I, it, was, it was a Friday morning here in Europe, and, and you know, Friday, the Friday prayers, and then there are demonstrations uh, after Friday prayers. And we had some technical issues on Bamboozer, and I, I Skyped a group of people saying, I'm sorry, we, we have some technical issues here. 
no worries, uh, don't worry about that, we just have a war here, so, <laughs> uh, with, with a smile afterwards, and, and I, they have humor, and they, they, I, I've been talking to people like the guy in Homs who've been sitting broadcasting, mortar falling around them, and, and they can joke, you can, talk, you, can, you can talk to them about pretty much everything, and, and quite a few of them like to talk about football, and the Spanish Barcelona, Real Madrid, and, and, and the competition between those two teams, like, it's fantastic. That is, it's that amazing. Is, like, is. Yeah, so, no, it's, it's absolutely amazing. As, as social media has come to play this bigger role in news coverage, especially in these conflict zones, there's always this worry with the YouTube video or with anything else that we can't verify it, that we don't really know who's behind it. Is it easier with live video? or How do you go about, how do you think about verification of, of the images that come through Bamboozer? Well, that, that's 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 an issue that's been discussed quite a lot, actually. Um, for us, it's it's not an issue, um, not uh, especially not now, as we got to know uh, most of the people. We know where they are, uh, we know who they are, uh, what kind of broadcasts they do. Uh, you can see where they are. You just no, no, we can't see what, but we, but we have a we have a pretty good idea geographically where they are. If they are in the Damascus suburb, or if they're in, they're in Homs or Dara or in Aleppo. Right. Wherever, and they they don't move around. But from from a news media perspective, uh, we don't take on any verification, uh, as as that not that's not our job. We don't have the resource to do that. But it's kind of interesting to see how news media uh, deal with verification. It's quite simple. They they quickly call in someone that can get a visual and confirm it's that city. Uh, they check the weather forecast, at the weather at that scene, uh, and compare it with the weather on the video. They listen to dialects, they look at car signs, street signs. And I would say uh, a news agency like Associated Press or, or Reuters or CNN, they can verify a video in, in less than 60 seconds, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and like you can't stage a war. Uh, that's, I would say, well, you. You possibly can, but but in these cases, I don't think you can. And and we always get the information on every single video coming in from Syria, what it is, um, and who's broadcasting. And so far, they've never been wrong, and never they, they never said anything that that doesn't doesn't um, that's not true. So, like we we're we're really confident with the contacts we have, and and we know how how news media. Do to verify and like what comes out is is one hundred percent correct. That's fascinating. I know safety is a yeah. big concern for you. You've told us that the regime specifically wants to stop live broadcasts from coming out of the country, specifically through Bamboozer. How do you help your people stay safe? And and in general, I mean, what are the challenges to doing this? Uh, I would say the biggest challenge is that you you risk your life. Uh, and and there is there is there is pretty much one single thing you have to look out for, and that's not to give away, away your your exact geographical position. So switching your GPS on the phone off is is crucial. Uh, we saw some broadcasters in the beginning uh, not knowing about this, but today we we don't see one single video uh, with a broadcaster that has his his or her GPS switched on. Uh, regarding safe, like we've been telling, trying to tell everyone not to do this. Uh, right, if they want to film it, uh, put the camera there, leave, and 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 put yourself in in, in a safe place. But but people don't want to leave; they want to be there. They want to document it. And and as you mentioned, the guy in Holmes, who's more known as Holmes Live, uh, he was very very specific every time he was sitting there, and and mortar was falling around him, like. I'm not going to leave. I'm 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 going to stay here either until Homs is free or until I die. How has this? So it's it's a, it's a strong. Sorry. I, I was just going to say. I mean, Syria is kind of an intense use case for Bamboozer. How has this conflict changed the way you see what you do and what Bamboozer does? Um. But I would say the whole situation that's been been uh, what's been going on in in the Middle East over the past say thirty months has changed a lot of how we 
think about what we're doing and and uh, uh, we 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 might be a bit naive a bit stupid but we we totally believe that bamboozer is is a tool that can be used for free speech or to 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 enable free speech and democrat democratization or be a part of that uh, way forward at least and uh, we're, we're spending huge amounts of time and resources in, in supporting activists all over the world and trying to help them to get the best or the most out of Bambooser and to help them to distribute the content. And we're, we're, we're not making any money whatsoever. Uh, we're not growing our user base substantially either, but it's become a thing that, it's, that is so important to everyone in the company so we, we, we're not going to deviate from that. We, we, we're still going to be there and, and, and be supportive as much as we possibly can. And what's next for Bamboozer? How do you grow as a company? How do you keep this kind of work going? Um, we, we, need, we, need to find, we need to find revenues elsewhere. And, and uh, just looking at what we're doing and what technology we have, what, what we've been developing now, and, and where we see the big the big bucks for us is going to be is, is going to it's about white labeling our technology and enabling particularly media companies to to integrate the bamboo technology into existing applications in primarily iOS and Android devices so for example like it could happen that CNN suddenly has the CNN app users on 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 Apple and, and Android devices can just open the CNN application and broadcast live directly to CNN, and I think that's going to be something that that's going to it's it's some it, that this is something that's going to change the media world. I don't know if it's going to be a lot or a bit, but it's definitely going to change the media world and and how you how you aggregate content and how you work with uh, with your audience. It sounds like you're a very sophisticated, highly impactful social enterprise. Is that a good a good description? Well, that, that sounded very nice. So, yeah, I say yes to that, definitely. <laughs> you're kind of a social enterprise. You're doing it, and yeah. you're going to make it sustainable. Well, yeah, like, no, yeah, definitely. definitely. Any, uh, well, any closing thoughts, anything about this episode in Syria that you wish the world knew about what it's been like at headquarters watching this all unfold? Um, it's, been, it's been a rough time, and, and uh, it's, it's been emotionally something that I've never experienced previous in my life and I, I, it's something I'm going to have to carry with me for the rest of my life, both the good things and the bad things. And, and, and the bad things or the bad thing is that I, I get to see dead people on a daily basis uh, and, and you, 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 you can never get used to seeing dead children, tortured children, uh, Mutilated children. That's that's something you you, you never you, you just you just go down when you see it. And but you have to watch it as I I, I as well as the Syria broadcasters and the Syri the people in Syria believe that it's important that the world see that and and get a context around it and not only uh, uh, a video on YouTube. With, with dead bodies. It, it needs to get a story around this of what has happened, why did it happen, and, and who committed this crime. Uh, so that's the bad thing. But the good thing is that seeing the f hearing and seeing and, and feeling the feedback we get, get from people in Syria for the little we actually do. We're just a technology supplier. Uh, but but people, people appreciate what we're doing, and, and, and that, means, that means a heck of a lot, and that keeps you going. Hans, thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you. Being with us. Hope to speak with you again and often, and we'll be watching Bamboozer on Twitter and, uh, and all around. Thank you. Thank you.